This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Thomas Ricks, who is a senior fellow at the Center for a New American Security. He is contributing editor at Foreign Policy, where he also blogs. He's the author of a number of books, including two books on the Iraq War, Fiasco, the American Mil Military Adventure in Iraq, and The Gamble, General Petraeus and the American Military Adventure in Iraq. 2006 to 2008. He is on the Berkeley campus in the spring this year uh, as the Nimitz lecturer. Tom, welcome to our program. Thank you for having me. Where were you born and raised? I was born in Beverly, Massachusetts. My father was a professor at the time at Harvard um, and then later moved to Brandeis. And then I was raised there in New York when my father moved to Columbia University and then later on in Afghanistan from 1969 to 1971. I was a teenager there. And, and looking back, how do you think your parents shaped your thinking about the world? Mainly through the extraordinary freedom they gave me. My, my parents had six kids, and in military terms, they were vastly outnumbered. <laughs> um, it was the 1960s, I think, which also was kind of overwhelming. Well, I had older brothers and sisters who were off doing crazy things and calling my parents in the middle of the night from California. We were in New York. Um, the result was when we lived in Afghanistan, I was 13, 14, 15, I was young enough to really not be noticed by adults much, old enough to absorb the language very quickly, and smart enough to skip school all the time. <laughs> and so I spent a lot of time down in the bazaar hanging out. Um, in the old city in Kabul, exploring Kabul. I made it my ambition to get to every town in Afghanistan with a population of more than 5,000. I made it to everyone except Faizabad in the Northeast. I would hop on buses, go to Kandahar, go to Herat, go down to Pakistan, which is the nearest bookstore. Um, my parents, a lot of the time, had no idea where I was. I actually took a bus once from Kabul to Germany, mm -hmm. through Iran and Turkey and so on. Um, and this would have been what years, actually? 1969, 1970, 1971, which is kind of an, Afghans tend to look back on it as the golden era. Um, it really was kind of thriving. The U.S. and the Soviets were both pouring aid into the country. And Kabul had actually become kind of an intellectual refuge, mm -hmm. both for Pakistanis and for Iranians. Kabul got some new hotels up and so on. I was once talking to the assassinated prime minister of, of uh, Pakistan, Benazir Bhutto, and she told me that as a teenager, she used to go up to Kabul to party. Mm. And she had a reputation, actually, for partying pretty hard. Mm. But they go up to the Intercontinental Hotel to dance and stuff, things she couldn't do in Pakistan at the time. Now, now how do you explain your, uh, your adventuresome streak? Was it because your father had, was, was an academic? What, and what was his field? And uh, but what was the, what was the uh, impetus? for you're already becoming, it sounds like, uh, a, uh, a reporter in, in about to be. <laughs> it, it's interesting, years later, actually, I picked up the uh, novel Kim mm -hmm. by uh, Rudyard Kipling. And it's, oh, this was the life I was leading. Mm -hmm. uh, knocking around the bazaar, talking in local languages. I actually dressed in Afghan clothes a lot, just because it made life easier as you're moving around. Uh, maybe a reporter to be, but also a writer to be. We had no television then. Afghanistan was one of the last countries without a television. And because I skipped school, I, re I read a lot of books. I tended to read a book a day there. Mm -hmm. And so that's one reason I went down to Peshawar. My parents would give me 100 bucks. Books were cheap down in Peshawar. I'd, I'd go down and, and buy 20 books, go back a month later and buy another 20. Mm -hmm. And, and w w what was the state of uh, Islam in Afghanistan at that time? Was there evidence of the, of, of the extreme religiosity or was it 
a, really a dynamic place where the modern world was meeting the traditional world. You had all those elements there. Yeah. Um, Kabul was a very cosmopolitan city, a sense of sort of being an open city. Uh, at the same time, there, there were a lot of women who were not wearing the shadri, the, the cover, and there were incidents of acid being thrown in their faces. My sister and I, when we were new there, were walking down Jati Maywan, which is a main road in the old city in Kabul. She was 18 at the time. She was wearing long pants, but I think her arms were uncovered from the elbow down, and uh, she was hit by a rock. So there were elements out there, but I felt extraordinarily safe in the country. Really, just I would literally hop on buses. I think it was 75 cents, 50 Afghanis at the time, to take the bus from Kabul to Kandahar. Check into a chai hana, a tea house, usually 10 afs, mm -hmm. or 15 cents for the night, um, and then hop another bus to Herat. Really, just knock around the country, go hiking in the hills, and so on. Uh, it was a lovely, lovely time. Uh, and then, where were you educated? I uh, went to the American International School of Kabul, which was a State Department sponsored school. Um, showed up frequently. Um, <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> didn't do particularly well, but in retrospect, got a pretty good education at the time because of my reading. I came back in 1971, where we'd lived before. My father was still attached to Columbia University, and went to Scarsdale High School and found that while I had read a lot, I had, didn't have the discipline, the background, the facts. Um, and so didn't do particularly well. Graduated with a 2.75 average, but did a lot of writing and was publishing some writing and by the skin of my teeth got into the University of Rochester and found that everything I'd read for the last six years suddenly kicked in. Hmm. And I got straight A's without a problem. And a professor took me aside one day there and said, you really need to go somewhere else now. You've gotten everything you got here. I said, where should I go? He said, Yale. I said, okay. So I, so I transferred, mm -hmm. um, applied and transferred. It was, it was, and I loved Yale. It was a, a really a, a fun place. After Yale, I taught at Yale China. Uh, through the Yale China program, I taught at Lingnan University in Hong Kong and realized one day, I was teaching English and American literature. I was preparing a lecture and realized most of what I was teaching were things I'd learned from my peers at Yale, not from my classes. Mm. You know, sitting around the dining room table, it really was a vibrant, interesting place to be. And, and so I think you, you helped us understand why the trajectory leading to be a uh, journalist, uh, 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 the conditions that, that pushed you in that direction. Question now is, uh, you're also a writer. You've written mm -hmm. uh, several books, even a novel about mm -hmm. uh, life in Afghanistan, I guess, before mm -hmm. uh, uh, an American invasion. Uh, 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 let's talk about writing. What, what led you to become a writer? What, how did that piece come together? Fundamentally, I think I have a writing gene. Mm -hmm. um, I come from a very verbal family. All of us um, seem to be writers. All the kids in the family sort of have different aspects of writing. I have a younger sister who just published a book on constitutional law. Um, another younger sister wrote a funny book about medicine once. Uh, so I think that's the first thing, just coming from this huge turbulent family where our dining room table was always covered with books, newspapers, and magazines, where I started reading The New Yorker, I think, when I was three or four, for the <laughs> cartoons, because it was lying around. Um, so I think before I was a journalist, I was a writer. I went to college assuming I'd become a professor of English literature. Teaching English and American literature in Hong Kong, I found that you know, what I really liked was writing. That was the attraction to me. And when I compare what I was doing to what my young American friends in Hong Kong were doing, which mainly were journalists, they were having more fun. First of all, people gave them credit cards to go places. And that seemed like such a nice racket to me. <laughs> I mean, you get to get on an airplane, check in a hotel, buy your meals, rent the car, and they pay for everything. Sounds good to me. Uh, so I went to the Wilson Quarterly, a magazine published by the Smithsonian. Went from there to eventually the Wall Street Journal. Enjoyed the Wall Street Journal. It really was that credit card knock around type of thing. Spent 17 years there, then moved to the Washington Post, and I was there for eight years. I have to say, though, in retrospect, I was never entirely comfortable mm -hmm. as a journalist. Uh, I always sensed the limitations of journalism. Uh, I was really struck by a line in Evelyn Waugh's novel, Scoop, 
News is what people who don't care much about anything read. Um, mm. It really is about the ephemeral and frequently about the trivial. And I would find myself at odds with those demands a lot. I remember one day an editor of mine walked up with a sad look on his face at the Washington Post and said, Tom, your lead on this story, the first sentence, he said, it's just not a Washington Post lead. And I looked at him and said, thank you. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, that's not what I'm trying to do here is write typical mm -hmm. leads. What, what, to help us, uh, what, what does it mean to be uh, uh, somebody who gives over their life to, to writing? What, what, what is that experience like for the person who is the writer? You know, I'm always sort of puzzled when people talk about how painful writing is. A friend of mine used to have a poster on his wall, writing is easy, you just stare at a typewriter until beads of blood appear on your forehead. <laughs> and I just never got that. I've always mm -hmm. liked to write. Um, I used to think about this when I was interviewing David Petraeus a lot in Iraq. Petraeus has to run every day. Some people need to run five miles a day. I really need to write a thousand words a day. It's one reason I do a blog, because sometimes when I'm doing book research, you really don't do much writing for a week or two at a spell. So for me, there's a simple joy, just in sitting and writing and putting stuff together. Yesterday afternoon, I took three hours and wrote an introduction to a book about T.E. Lawrence that a friend of mine is writing and asked me to, to, to help him out with it for the introduction. It was just, it was a pleasure. I sat down, I think around 1.30, and I stood up mm -hmm. at 5.30 and I had 980 words on the page. He'd asked for 800 words. So. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, it's just, it's uh, the most natural process in the, in the world. Recently, I, on a Monday morning, I woke up at 5 a.m. and my wife said, why are you getting up so early? And I said, I haven't written since Friday. <laughs> so so do you, is it, it is as if the what you write just flows through you? Or it, it doesn't sound like for you it's a struggle, it's a joy. It, 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 that's right, it, it is a joy. And the funny thing was the newspapers were a struggle with me. I was never, I mean, I won a couple of Pulitzer Prizes. I was part of teams that won Pulitzer Prizes. But journalism was never easy for me. It always was kind of feeling like my shoulders were hitting the box. I'd never feel that way in book writing. Book writing to me is almost like taking dictation. I mean, especially with Fiasco, which was written in a 360-day frenzy, mm -hmm. um, where I just worked nonstop. I mean, I literally, it was 360 days of 18-hour days without a, without a break. Um, but for me, that, that book especially was just, boom, sit down and write. Uh, with very little looking back, in fact, very little um, revision on it. I finished writing it, I remember, in December, and I went downstairs to the basement where my wife was writing her own book. And I said, I finished it. She said, what do you think? I said, I don't care if it doesn't sell a single copy. I've mm -hmm. written what I set out to write. Mm -hmm. uh, and for me, it was just, here's my testimony about what's going on. And I was talking about this last night in my lecture. The only reason I can think of to write a book is because you really are compelled to. You have to get out of your head. Um, it's something that's nagging you. And you can either have all these thoughts and words chasing around inside your skull or you can get them out. So for me it was kind of almost a, a process to what the hell happened in Iraq? Was I was trying to sort of puzzle through. Here's this US military which I've covered for a long time. I have a lot of friends in the military, a lot of people I admire in the military. How could this magnificent institution screw it up so badly? And that was the driving question for me behind Fiasco. But before we talk about uh, your works on Iraq, I'm curious, what, what was the, uh, the factor or factors that uh, led to your interest in the military? It actually goes back to um, the 1970s. And the two events that really struck me, 1975, I was in college, and Saigon fell. And for me, that was a real timeout moment. Wait a second. You know, all those demonstrations my parents hauled me to when I was a little kid about Vietnam. Nobody ever said the result of this is going to be a communist takeover of South Vietnam. And watching that unfold with the Cambodian Holocaust, with the boat people fleeing Vietnam, I think America, especially the American left, has never really come to terms with what that meant. Um, were we really right? And including, you know, the U.S. government. I actually think the assassination of Jam in 1963 in, in Vietnam was a disastrous moment in the Vietnam War. And 
really sh something we should keep, should keep in mind. So the first event is the fall of Saigon. The second event was the fall of Kabul in December 1979. Um, again, wait a second. This is not how it's supposed to be. There are not supposed to be Soviet tanks rolling through my old neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And so those two events were a real kind of political awakening for me that made me think what I've been taught to assume about the world, about the U.S. military, isn't really accurate. So I need to study this more myself. What I found, I was by accident for the Wall Street Journal in the neighborhood of Grenada when, that, when we invaded that country. So I was kind of just thrown into it, and then subsequently was thrown in as a backup reporter into Central America. What I found covering the military was I really enjoyed it. One of the problems of newspaper reporting in Washington, D.C. is there's a certain bloodlessness to it. You cover the State Department, it's just policy, it's not really real. Uh, the White House is very constrained in what you can cover, people you can talk to. Congress actually is a bit more lively because there's a lot of different people doing things. Uh, uh, and intelligence is a horrible beat because everybody always lies to you. What I found with covering the military is you have real people doing real things. And so you don't just have policy at the tactical level, you can actually go out and see things. You can compare what's the policy, what's the theory, what's the practice, what's the reality on the ground, which endlessly intrigued me. Uh, you can write about foreign policy, technology, um, demographics. It's a great way of looking at America, as I did in using the book Making the Corps, to look not just at the Marines, but also the 18-year-old American, who I found, to my surprise, to be the most articulate of critics once he trusted you and his discussion of American society. Uh, so I, I came to really enjoy the military just as a broad subject of, of endlessly interesting. And also, I love history. And I found before I wrote about anything, there was always a good book of history. You're going to go on an aircraft carrier, read about the history of aircraft carriers, read, a, read about how carriers operate, and so on. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, in, in the aftermath of the end of the Cold War, in the aftermath of 9-11, you actually were, as a journalist, were going around to a lot of the hot spots and getting a feel on the ground for how the military was adapting to a, essentially the, the new world that, that they had to act in in ways that call for a very different mission. When I took the Pentagon beat, uh, I'd been uh, an editor. I took the Pentagon beat in 1991, I think it was. And I remember my boss took me aside and said, you know, the Cold War is over, and so what you're really going to do is cover uh, the conversion of the U.S. military into other things. Like, airplane manufacturers are now going to make refrigerators, he said. Remember that phrase. That's going to be what you write about. Okay? Um, it turned out he was obviously entirely wrong. What I found myself was in a nonstop run for several years. Somalia, Bosnia, Haiti, Kosovo, Iraq, Afghanistan. Uh, and it was an adaptive process. And in fact, I was in Mogadishu with the 1st Battalion, 7th Marines uh, in December 1991 and wrote an article for the Wall Street Journal about the Marines adapting to this mission. But I remember walking along a dusty road near the Mogadishu Airport with uh, Corporal Armando Rodriguez, who was an acting squad leader. And he was, I said, how did you get to a situation where you're this young man in this strange country, in a difficult environment, and you're leading this squad through this? And I said, a guy your age, your background, your education, we wouldn't trust to run the Xerox machine in my office. And here we are, essentially trusting you with national policy. And he said, it's all about Paris Island. And I said, OK, I've got to look into that. Mm -hmm. Made a mental note, went down to Paris Island, um, and said, yeah, there's going to be a book in this, about this. And so really, as the military was adapting, I was looking at that constantly and, and writing books about that over the course of 20 years. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, you talked about the fall of Saigon, the fall of Kabul. And so as a person who uh, both loved, respected, 
and analyzed and could be critical about the military. What, what were your feelings as the Iraq war unfolded, especially in its, it, its first phase? Because it, it seemed to be a breakdown of almost all of our institutions. I had a feeling of deep unease. Actually, 2003, 04, and 05 were actually a very difficult time for me personally. It was just an enormous strain in sort of looking at this. Uh, I had actually thought that invading Afghanistan after 9-11 was exactly the right thing to do. Um, you know, Al-Qaeda came out of there. Sure, they were all Saudi Arabians, but they were almost all. But they were based in Afghanistan. Uh, from the beginning, Iraq just puzzled me. Why are we doing this? And when I would go to people I knew at the Pentagon, senior officers, names people know, and I'd ask, well, I don't understand what's going on here. And they'd say, neither do we. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wrote about this in Fiasco, actually. So many um, officers on the combatant commands around the world, the senior sort of U.S. military headquarters, had queried the Joint Staff, why are we doing this drive to Iraq? that a really unusual order was issued, you will consider any invasion of Iraq to be part of the global war on terror. Well, okay, the military got the message, and that's right for them to get the message. In our system, you do want a civilian oversight of the military, a military consciously subordinate of civilian control. And so when the civilians say, you know, this is part of the war on terror, they said, okay, it's part of the war on terror. But the screw up in Iraq was far deeper than that. Uh, I remember being in Baghdad in the spring of 03, in the immediate aftermath of the invasion, this is May, and being struck by the enormous discrepancy between what the Americans said and thought and what the Iraqis did. By luck, one of my colleagues was Anthony Shadid at the Washington Post. He's now at the New York Times, terrific reporter, really nice guy. I was embedded with the 1st Armored Division, then commanded by Major General Ricardo Sanchez, who went on to become the American commander in the first year. He was essentially embedded in Sadr City with the Sadrist. Every couple of days, Anthony and I would meet at the Washington Post Bureau, have a few beers, sit out back and talk. And I got the sense in those weeks, this is the only place in Baghdad where these two very different views are being brought together and compared. I think my all-time favorite story was on Memorial Day of 2003. Anthony and I went out with the first um, armored division and uh, the first armored division patrol. The, the name is armored. It was an infantry patrol in West Baghdad. And we had talked to the lieutenant and his commanders before this. I embedded in the patrol and walked with them and talked with them. We were in a section of Baghdad called Yarmouk in West, West Baghdad, a very Baathist um, Sunni and actually very much uh, military retirees section of, of Baghdad. Anthony walked along behind the patrol talking to the Iraqis. And it was painfully evident at the end of the patrol, Anthony and I sat down, and the American soldiers were saying, they love us, see the kids. They stopped off, they visited an orphanage, they were very careful to take off their sunglasses before going in. They put their weapons outside, left them under guard with another soldier. And their point was, the kids love us, we visited the orphanage, we're protecting people. And Anthony said, well, when I talked to the Iraqi men outside the orphanage, they said you went inside to have sex with the teachers. Uh, and one of the young soldiers said, but what about the kids? He said, well, you're seeing some of the kids. I went over and talked to a 15-year-old who said, when they walk by, they walk on my heart. This was just stunning, shocking to the Americans. And we sat down and wrote that story. An odd thing about being a military correspondent is the better your material, the easier it is to write. Combat is the easiest thing in the world to cover. You just mm -hmm. sit and write it down, and it goes bam. I was once am in an ambush, and the story took 20 minutes to write, right on the front page of the Post mm -hmm. the next day. Anthony and I sat down and wrote that story, and it just sailed onto the front page of the next day's Post. And to me, that really captured the essence of the problem, just fundamental misunderstandings about what we thought we were doing there and how the Iraqis perceived it. This uh, raises uh, the interesting question about the whole problem of embedding and how one navigates you know, on the one hand, really reporting and analyzing what's going on, uh, and doing that in a context where you're, you're not becoming uh, 
uh, uh, servant of the Pentagon propaganda mm -hmm. machine. But on the other hand, as you just pointed out, uh, if you're doing your job well and you're you're getting sources of information from different places, you you can really reveal both the good on our side and mm -hmm. and, and the bad. Yeah, I'm a big fan of embedding. I've always thought. First of all, it's a great way to educate a reporter. And one of the problems we have nowadays with reporters is not, of them, not a lot of them have military experience or understanding. Being embedded, first of all, just teaches you a lot. Uh, I would never have an idle moment in an embed. I mean, if I'm just sitting there and it's boring, I would turn to a soldier and say, you're the 50 cal gunner, explain the 50 cal to me. When you look at this piece mm -hmm. of machinery, what do you think? I've done this with pilots. Walk me around your aircraft. When you look at this, what does this mean to you? How does this work? What do you like about it? What do you dislike about it? So it's endlessly educating. Um, the second thing is, the military view is a legitimate view. You want to uh, present it. In fact, to my readers, it was the most important thing. These were their wives, husbands, sons, brothers, sisters in the field. And that's a crucial story for the American reader to understand. My third thought in being an embed was, I'm writing for several audiences at the Washington Post. I'm writing for a huge military establishment around Washington. And every story I write, there's somebody who actually knows the subject better than me. So a little bit of humility helps. I'm also writing for members of Congress and the 20,000 people who work for them and the 100,000 people who lobby them, who have a lot of influence over the military but generally know nothing about it. Third, I'm writing for people who know nothing about any of this, and I, and I need to make them understand it and care about it also. So these several different audiences really struck me. In Iraq, there was another audience that began to worry me. One day I was talking to an intelligence officer, and he said, Tom, I just thought you should know, we were going into an Iraqi military headquarters, and one of your stories was printed out and pinned up on the wall. Mm. Interesting, okay. So people who are the enemy are now reading me in real time. What does that mean? How do you take that into account? Uh, so embedding to me was, you'll get, it's, it's like the blind man and the elephant. Um, yeah, you'll, you'll feel the leg of the elephant. Is it the whole elephant? No, but it's an important part of that elephant and one that my readers really cared about. Now, in, in addition to, to, as you were embedded and, and walking the, 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 uh, uh, the streets of Baghdad as you just described, uh, uh, what was, what were your other sources of information about what was going on? Because you had a situation where our military was now wired. How did that impact on the conversation you could have with different levels of the military mm -hmm. to sort of ultimately reveal uh, the, the absolute terrible situation that we placed our soldiers in. In Fiasco, you had, uh, you clearly were reading a lot of the battlefield reports, and there was one report that you quote by a soldier or an officer saying that what we were doing there was pasting feathers hoping for a duck, an amazing quote. Yeah. Ta quote. Uh, I had a fairly conscious intellectualized approach to reporting, which is there is always a level of action. There's a level at which there's a guy who knows what the theory is, but also knows what the practice is. In different wars, it's different levels. If I'm covering World War I, it's probably the division or even the core level. Uh, World War II, almost certainly the division or the regimental combat team level. Uh, in small wars, frequently, it's the platoon or company commander level. I found in Iraq it was the battalion level. Hmm. These guys knew what the theory was. Sometimes the division commander was just clueless, never got out of his headquarters. Uh, frequently, the top commanders of Atreus would be very well informed. Then you had a couple of levels of, of profound ignorance and then some really informed levels. What I found in Iraq was that was the battalion commander level. So I spent a lot of time with battalion commanders. Uh, what I typically would do was come in country and say to the military, give me all the briefings you want. Hit me with your best shot. So you get all the theory. And then I would descend every echelon down um, from corps, division, uh, brigade, battalion, company, platoon, squad, fire team. And when I got down to the bottom, I'd say, okay, now I'm going to go back up mm. to the level where reality meets, meets, meets theory. 
and that would again take me back up to battalion. Then at the end, I usually would go back to the very top people and say, this is what you told me, this is what I saw, this is the discrepancy I perceive, how would you explain that? And kind of an iterative process, a really almost Hegelian synthesis coming out of it. Then when I wrote Fiasco, I took all my reporting and I sat down to write and discovered something that I hadn't expected, hadn't really come home to me yet, which was all the people I had talked to in Iraq. And by that point, I think, I had talked to, well, my colleague, Vern Loeb, had talked to almost every single battalion commander there that year and knew them and were in contact with them. As I fin finished each section of the book, I would email it to everybody who was mentioned because I had all their email addresses. And mm -hmm. you could figure out what their email addresses are if they were in the military pretty easily. And so I would email and say, here's what I'm writing. Speak now or forever hold your peace. And guys would write back to me, sorry, Tom, look, I was in a firefight all yesterday. I'm really whipped, but give me till tomorrow and I'll write to you. The next day, a thoughtful note would come frequently with attachments. And here's the significant incident report I filed. And then I got into some nastier stuff and people would say, well, look, here's the affidavit I filed. So I go through the affidavit and put that in the book. And I'd send it to everybody who was in the affidavit. Guys would write back, look, I don't know how you found out who I am, um, but clearly you've been talking to my battalion commander. Let me tell you, you know, here's, here's my take on it. Here's, here's the statement I gave to investigators. I wound up going through about 32,000 pages of documents, um, mm -hmm. compiling them and, and, and sending people again and again. Here's the chapter as it stands now. The most interesting of this was General Odierno who is uh, criticized very heavily in fiasco, but actually praised quite well in Gamble, interesting difference. He initially declined to talk to me. I said, fine, you know, that's, that's your privilege. Then I sent him the chapter about his division, and he came hustling over to my office with a pile of documents. I said, here, let me, you know, and we mm -hmm. sat and talked for most mm -hmm. of a day with his side of the story. Interestingly, when I did the Gamble, he was very open with me despite my being having been very critical of him in fiasco, and I think it's because he thought he, he disagreed with it, but he'd gotten a fair shot. He'd had his chance to get, tell his side of the story and give his response. Mm -hmm. Let me uh, very briefly show the two books. Fiasco is the story of the, the first phase of the war, and uh, your second book, The Gamble, is the story of, of uh, the turnaround under uh, General uh, Petraeus. And uh, in Fiasco, you really uh, do more than what was going on in Iraq. It's really an analysis of the strategic debate in Washington, the failure of the press, the failure of, mm -hmm. of the Congress. Uh, talk a little about that, and because it, it seems absolutely essential to understand the failure in Washington, to understand uh, the, the failure uh, in Iraq because we didn't have the resources on the battlefield we ne needed and, and we were very unclear what we were doing there and, and this mm -hmm. was not uh, 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 something that the military should be providing. It really should be the mm -hmm. civilian leadership. You write a book for one reason, at least I do, is because you have to and Fiasco is very much figuring out how did we have this massive failure. Uh, since I wrote Fiasco I've actually come to I think achieve or get to an even sort of broader understanding. I think actually what happened was after 9-11 we had a national panic. The role of our leaders should be to tamp down panic and I think the Bush administration, President Bush, Vice President Cheney instead fed that panic. I think they panicked personally. Uh, partly because even the White House was perceived to have been under attack. Donald Rumsfeld had the panic, was in the Pentagon when it was hit by the airliner. Uh, so I think this was very personal for them, and I do think they were knocked off balance. And I think the whole country was knocked off balance. And remember, we invaded Iraq just uh, two years after 9-11, and I think it took us several years to regain our equilibrium. And when the country was off balance, people were not thinking clearly. It, it, it wasn't just the press, it was the, a massive failure of Congress to deal with this. Um, there was an air of confusion about the entire enterprise. I was constantly struck in Iraq that the civilians and the military, the U.S. civilians like Bremer and the military were at odds in their understanding of the mission. Bremer was trying to carry out revolutionary operations. Let's transform Iraq into a beacon of democracy. 
the military on its own redefined the mission as stability. Well, those two missions are at odds, and they never re re resolved that. And so we had these sort of people just bat butting heads together, and the Iraqis wondering, what are these people trying to do here? Mm -hmm. and, and going back to your earlier experiences after the end of the Cold War, it, it seems that this was uh, these questions were never resolved in our own mind. I mean, do we intervene in places like uh, Kosovo or Somalia for humanitarian concerns, or are we doing it for our security interests? And it seems that as the Bush administration was trying to figure out what it had gotten itself into, that they were constantly changing in their own mind what what they wanted to accomplish there. Well, actually, I, I would disagree with that a bit. I think the Bush administration was very clear in what it thought it was doing. It was responding to 9-11, and I remember Paul Wolfowitz, who was in many ways the intellectual architect of this, um, we're going to drain the swamp of terror. And their whole attitude, anytime anybody brought up an objection, that's old thinking, that's pre-9-11 thinking. Wolfowitz liked to say, well, if they, if you, that's exactly the type of thing that led to 9-11. All those State Department Arabists talking about the Arab street, saying, you know, you can't do that. No, this, everything was new. It was almost a Trotskyite sort of, this is, you know, year zero. History has nothing to tell us here. And so they were very clear about what they thought they were doing. In retrospect, it was an insane mission. The world's youngest culture is going to go in and change the world's oldest, oldest culture at the point of a gun. And we're going to get out quickly. Remember, the original plan was to be down to 30,000 troops in Iraq by September 2003. This was going to be a six-month mission. Uh, the hubris, the insanity of this is just striking to me in, in retrospect. The problem I have with the military is the military, instead of saying, time out, this is an insane mission, said, well, when you've got a crazy mission, let's just redefine it without mm -hmm. telling anybody. And so you have them carrying out missions that are directly at odds with what the U.S. officials are trying to do. The Fallujah brick factory really stands out in my mind on this. Bremer says, we're going to have a free market, flat tax, sort of neoconservative society right here in the middle of the Arab world. And so he starts, among other things, he shuts down the Baathist party. All you people with power, you got no future here. Dissolves the Iraqi army, which we told them we wouldn't do when we dropped leaflets. And closes down inefficient government factories. Well, one of the inefficient government factories they closed down was the Fallujah brick factory. Suddenly, there's a lot of young men in Fallujah looking for work. We're not providing it. Go to the free market, we said. You know what the free market was? Al-Qaeda. They had money, and they were hiring. And they killed American troops. So this approach the Americans had, confused and free market, led directly to the killing of American troops. And so the American commanders are saying, this is nuts. And so you get things like Petraeus up in Mosul, basically ignoring the American civilians down in Baghdad. He's hiring Baathist. He has an independent foreign policy with Syria. Uh, he's very effective. But the U.S. military doesn't like Petraeus particularly. Is kind of ignoring what he's doing. They want to keep on sort of fighting more conventionally. If we had recognized Petraeus' successes early on, in the spring of 04, you could have put him in charge. That's what we would have done in World War II. Let's put that guy in charge. He's figured this out. Mm -hmm. And instead, it took the military another three or four years of really being mired in an unproductive, wasteful approach before they finally said, ah, this isn't working. Let Dave try. The, the, the second book, The Gamble, is really about how uh, Oderno and Petraeus turn things around. What, what are the key factors there uh, as, and I know you're interested in this broader question of uh, what makes for great leaders in our, our military? I'll give you a, an answer that may surprise you. It certainly surprises me. I actually think the beginning of wisdom was humility. Um, we finally, after several years, we shut up and started asking Iraqis, you know, you guys have been here a couple of thousand years, what do you think we should do? <laughs> um, and in even putting our power subordinate to Iraqis, what do you want to do and how can we help you do it? And when we started asking some questions, the answer started getting interesting, which is, you know, we really don't like these Al-Qaeda guys. If you would just kind of get off our backs, 
you know, we'd like to deal with them. And you had these little signs in the spring, late you know, 06 in Ambar, early 07 in Baghdad. A key moment is a local insurgent came to an American commander in West Baghdad and said, you know, you and I have been fighting here, but tomorrow I'm going to be attacking some Al-Qaeda guys because we really don't like them. And if you could just, like, not bother us, we'd really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. And so he said, okay, we'll stand back. Mm -hmm. Well, he, the American commander, battalion commander, stands back to watch this. And it doesn't go quite right. The Al-Qaeda fighters are a tougher opponent than the insurgents had thought. And the insurgents start to lose the fight. In the middle of this, they ask for American aid. These are the people who have been blowing us up a week earlier. Well, you need some real good intellectual flexibility and strategic understanding. The American commander goes to their aid. Petraeus hears about this and summons the battalion commander. You know, this guy must have thought, whoa, here goes my career. Petraeus says, this is really interesting, tell me what you're doing. Mm -hmm. The same thing is happening out in Ambar province where people we had considered the enemy were saying, you know, we could actually work out something here. We ended up putting, the Americans ended up putting the Sunni insurgency on the American payroll. 100,000 fighters, $30 million a month. Sounds like a lot of money, but it's, you know, about what George Steinbrenner used to pay a bad second baseman. Good deal from my, to my mind. We did it behind the backs of the Iraqi government. And that really was the beginning of the turnaround. So humility, realizing we don't understand it, and obeying Warren Buffett's key insight that if you've been playing poker for half an hour and you don't know who the patsy at the table is, you're the patsy. <laughs> we stopped making ourselves the patsy. We started asking some questions. And that was the beginning of wisdom. Um, I think empathy, humility, and drive are the three things that really were key in beginning the turnaround. But I want to emphasize, I think the turnaround was only tactical. It was not strategic. Um, the purpose of the surge was not only uh, to overcome the, the, the difficulties, but also to, to change the politics of Iraq. Those politics have not changed. What's happening in Iraq is, is I actually think, quite worried, um, quite worrisome right now. And I think Iraq is, in the long run, um, has a lot of trouble ahead of it. We still have a very small understanding of how much the Iraq war is going to cost us. Uh, this is going to play out over another decade or two. The, 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 there's an interesting point I want to make, which was one of the aspects of the Bush administration was, well, we don't do that because Clinton did it. So mm -hmm. th that is rejecting the past. Part of what Petraeus and Oderno did was to go back to what the military knew about counterinsurgency. Is, mm -hmm. that, is that correct? I mean, mm -hmm. that, so, so the, a doctrine that was dismissed because of the outcome of the Vietnam War really was brought back. That is, mm -hmm. uh, you need to protect the population, listen mm -hmm. to the people, and the primary mission is not to protect your own soldiers. Yeah. Um, the conventional U.S. military view had been that we're all about the annihilation of the enemy. And that was very much the lesson of World War II. You know, go kill Nazis. That's the road, the road home goes through Berlin. Petraeus' insight, and this comes partly out of his having done a PhD dissertation at Princeton on the Vietnam War, was no, this is really about making the enemy irrelevant. And they got in some really good foreign experts, David Kilcullen out of Australia, Emma Skye out of Britain. And Kilcullen said, you know, the worst thing you can do with your enemy is kill him. Then you're just walking into blood feuds. Um, the second, but the best thing you can do with your enemy is to flip him, to get him to come over to your side. He knows the whole situation. He knows everybody. He knows how these things work. The second best thing is to capture him and get some intelligence information. The third best thing is to demoralize him so he just stops fighting. And the worst thing is to, to uh, kill him. And that really required a reorientation. Let's not focus on the enemy because all we're doing every time we kill people is make more enemies. Let's focus on the people. And so the, Petraeus and Odierno moved their troops off the big bases where they'd been out driving in Humvee patrols for one hour a day and the enemy controlling the neighborhood for the other 23, moving them out into the neighborhoods, a platoon-sized um, little outpost. In a platoon, usually you have three squads, and they'd always try to have one squad out, one squad resting, one squad preparing, and one squad out on a 24-hour cycle. That suddenly meant you were in the neighborhoods constantly. And you began to develop a sense of what's right, what's wrong. Even if you don't speak the language, you can say, you know, that truck is there every morning, or, hey, I've never seen that truck. And you can turn to an interpreter and say, find out where that truck's from. Oh, 
it's from Fallujah. Oh, that's bad. That's where the bombs come from. And so f finally these people started actually understanding their, their micro environment, which is what you have to do in that side of war. Now, now you were saying that you, and, and I, that you think the future of Iraq is dicey. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 in, in, and I guess in part we still haven't addressed the problems of tribalism, sectarianism, you know, political solutions, mm -hmm. division mm -hmm. of the oil, uh, and so on. So, uh, so I guess the, the question is, what is an outcome that we should want, basically? Is it mm -hmm. to stabilize to the extent possible so that we can withdraw? Or, or obviously, we're not going to transform uh, Iraq into the democracy that was the original Wolfowitz goal. All the basic questions that vexed Iraq before the surge are still there. The only difference is the Americans got out more or less with their dignity intact, um, though I think we'll be blamed for this for a long time. But the basic question is, how do you divide oil revenue? What's the fundamental relationship between Kurds, Sunni, Shiite? Where does power reside in Iraq? Will you have a strong central government or a loose confederation? All those questions led to violence in the past in Iraq before the surge. The surge solved none of them. All of them are still there. All of them are likely to lead to violence again. The dominating question I thought would be oil at the time I was writing the gamble. I actually think now it probably is the sectarian question. When we invaded Iraq, we knocked down what the Arabs saw as their barrier against Persian power. And they fear Persian power. For 2,000 years, it has loomed over them. And we've knocked that apart. We essentially have moved Shiite power a few hundred miles west to the Euphrates River. Doesn't seem like a lot to us, it's huge in the Arab world. I think what you're seeing, for example, today in Bahrain is in many ways probably a Sunni-Shiite proxy conflict. And so I think we've intensified this division. The Sunnis are not reconciled to the ascendancy of the Shiites who have been dominated by them for 500 years. A friend of mine in the U.S. government recently said he expected the first nuclear exchange in history to be between a Sunni and Shiite power, mm. in which each side has nuclear weapons and uses them. Mm -hmm. If that happens, I think historians might well back, look back at the invasion of Iraq as the lighting of that fuse. Mm -hmm. And, and what, what has this uh, fiasco turned into a gamble uh, what, what are the consequences for the U.S. military? Uh, 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 because the question, we learn something in Iraq. We change course. Mm -hmm. It's not going to deliver the ideal outcome, as you just explained. But ha has the learning experience impacted the military so we won't do another Iraq? in the way we did uh, the first phase of this war? Uh. The U.S. military learned enormous amounts in Vietnam, and then in the mid-1970s threw it all out the door, partly because they were so sick of that war, partly because the American people had said, we're not going to do that again. And then it seems like we lost that lesson over the course of a generation, and we did do it again. So while we've learned a lot in Iraq, and the U.S. military has adapted enormously, it's, it's so different than it was on September 10th, 2001. I'm not sure that those lessons will be retained. Um, what we've seen, especially in Petraeus and Odierno, was the importance of critical thinking. And that's actually one reason I really like and admire things like the Berkeley ROTC program. You really want well-educated, mm -hmm. thoughtful officers able to bring to bear some intellectual firepower on these problems. I worry, though, that these lessons are discarded very quickly. We're not going to do that again. Well, guess what? We probably end up doing that again. Um, Petraeus is not a popular figure within the U.S. Army, in, in many ways deeply resented. You know, Princeton intellectual, Ph.D., likes reporters, successful in Iraq, you know, three strikes in, in the eyes of a lot of other hmm. generals. Uh, and he is kind of an outlier. You always have these sort of officers in the military, but the question is whether they're put in positions of command. Before 
Petraeus, H.R. McMaster, some of the other people that Petraeus brought in, before they were put in a position to actually affect the war in Iraq, the U.S. Army fought there for several years, fought in Iraq longer than it fought in World War II, before it very grudgingly said, okay, let them have a try. Um, so I don't know. I think the jury is very much out as to whether these lessons will be taken, assimilated. Uh, my bet is no. The bureaucracy does not like to absorb change. The military mindset is very conservative. Uh, the Army especially has a very cautious mindset. I think the Army is mired in 20th century industrial era ways of management. And I think this could be very damaging in the long run to them. You uh, have a feel for Afghanistan based on your experience with the country. You clearly have a feel of kind of uh, a change within the military. At the same time, you, you have a, a, a great respect for it as an institution. What, uh, you, you haven't really covered the Afghan war in the recent period, but, but how do you put those two things together? Help us uh, think, tell us the questions we should be asking about mm -hmm. what we're doing in Afghanistan. Uh, the problem question in my mind is we've never sorted out in our counterinsurgency theory the problem of the host government. Our counterinsurgency approach is based on the British and French colonial experience, and they generally were fighting to stay there. In Iraq and Afghanistan, I do genuinely believe we are fighting to leave. We're trying to get out. And so we've never resolved that fundamental contradiction. You just don't want to establish a colonial government that's beholden to you, like theirs were beholden to London and Paris. And so both in Iraq and Afghanistan, I actually see conflict with the host government as a good thing. When Karzai attacks us, that's a sign of power on his part. He has to if he's going to establish his street credibility as an independent actor, if he's going to move beyond puppethood. Uh, so I think in both cases I'm looking at the host governments, and I actually think there's a great academic study to be done of host-nation relations, Korea, Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan. When I was studying the Korea, Korean War in, in, in Vietnam as well, you notice there's enormous amounts of friction between the Americans and the local government. I mean, we, we killed the leader of South Vietnam, or we're complicitly in this killing, in, our, in our 1963. So that's the first question on, on my mind, is basically how do we get kicked out, and how do we recognize getting kicked out is victory for us? Because mm -hmm. that's the only way I think we, 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 we really get out of these things. The other big question on my mind is the state of the U.S. military. We're in an unprecedented state here. We've been fighting now for almost 10 years continuously with really a small fraction of the population. The U.S. military is about 1% of the population, 1.5% with dependents. Of the U.S. military, only about half is Army and, and Marine Corps, and only about half of them have actually been fighting the war. So it really is like 0.25% that we've thrown in again and again. Uh, the typical infantryman now has a lot more combat experience than any people we had in World War II. They've been, they're on their fifth, sixth tours, and so on. I think it's unconscionable what we're doing to these people, what we're doing to these families. Uh, we've never done this sort of thing before, and uh, the burden we're putting on that 1% that of the society and the other 99% ignoring it uh, worries me, first just as a democracy, but also just as a moral issue. Mm -hmm. the, the, the Middle East is changing, and we're not controlling the change. You talked about the Sunni-Shia conflict. We have the emergence of, uh, of uh, democratization movements in, in places like Egypt, but we don't, we don't really know what the outcome will be because there, there are no institutions. Are we now in a bind where we really don't have a strategy to deal with that region, and, and until we have a strategy, uh, if that's possible, mm -hmm. given the complexity, th then our military is going to find itself as a, as a football? Uh, I actually think we do have a strategy, mm -hmm. but we're not willing to put our money where our mouth is. We're explicitly on the side of democratization. That's the President Obama's statement. He's just not willing to do anything to support it, as far as I can tell. Uh, so what you're seeing is uh, us acting like a second-rate power. Um, we're willing to make recommendations, but not willing to do anything about it. And we've kind of reduced ourselves to the level of France and Britain, who are saying, no, you should do something. 
So I think we're right now seeing an experiment in the absence of American leadership. Mm -hmm. And what will change that? Uh, are we too weak in economic terms and in other respects to, to, to be able to do all that we might do? No, actually, I actually don't think, you know, a no-fly zone, for example, or other sorts of, sorts of intervention in Libya would be that expensive. First of all, I would expect a lot of the forces involved to be Arab. Saudi Arabian Air Force, Egyptian Air Force, maybe the Moroccans. Um, what we bring to the table is know-how, how you actually do one of these things, and command and control. Um, this, this is, it's a complex thing. What's the rules of engagement? Uh, what do you do when a surface-to-air missile is fired from the courtyard of a mosque? Um, how do you deal with helicopters? This can get very messy very quickly, and we have a lot of experience in that. Um, so I don't think it, no, I actually think it's a, um, President Obama's reluctance, I think, is a considered one. I, I think he's a very thoughtful man. Um, but it's not economic. It's not like we can't afford this. In fact, I actually think the Arab League probably, if asked, could pay for it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something he really does not want to do it, is my mm -hmm. impression. Mm -hmm. uh, one final question, and that is this. You, you, uh, there are two sectors of our audience, journalism students, and uh, uh, ROTC students. Mm -hmm. How would you suggest that they prepare for the future in both cases? What, what kind of, what should they do with their education? What, what kind of experience should they generate so that they will be effective actors in, in this kind of world that's emerging? The two things that have really helped me that I generally would recommend is learn a foreign culture and a foreign language together. Learn that culture, and it, that really is just intellectual expansion of the most basic sort. It's, it's an endlessly fertile approach. The second thing is read history. Read deeply, read widely in history. It's a, it's a, it's a bottomless well of knowledge for us. History does not operate by parallels. I think someone famously said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. <laughs> and um, there are ways of informing us I mean, I was really struck. I just happened to be, I was look, thinking about Libya and went back and read Roman history. Um, one of the Roman emperors, one of the greatest ones, came out of eastern Libya. The, the word, the name Tripoli is actually Greek, from Tripolis, the three cities that were close together on the coast. I was struck to see that eastern Libya and Crete together were a Roman province. And so it's just a little bit of Roman history sort of informed my, my view of eastern Libya. Mm -hmm. um, so I think just really foreign cultures, foreign languages, and reading history of all sorts uh, were really uh, great approaches for either journalist or Rossi students. Mm -hmm. let, me, let me show you two books again. Uh, the Gamble, about the turnaround in uh, Iraq, and uh, Fiasco, uh, about uh, the, the first phases of the war. Uh, and the title says it all. And uh, uh, Tom, I want to thank you for, for taking the time to come on our program. It was a very informative discussion. You're welcome. I enjoyed it. And thank you very much for joining us for this Conversation with History.